Hello viewers, welcome to the video lectures for class 11th economics. We were discussing the first chapter of economics which is Indian economy on the eve of independence. Till now we have discussed about how the British colonial rule reduced India into a feeder economy for Great Britain's rapidly expanding modern industrial base. Remember India was being called as a feeder economy because of two reasons. First that India became a net supplier of raw materials for the British industries and secondly India became a market for the finished goods from British industries. Now we would discuss about the state of foreign trade, infrastructure, occupational structure, demographic condition of the Indian economy on the eve of independence. The restrictive policies of trade and tariff pursued by the colonial government adversely affected the structure and composition of India's foreign trade. The opening of the Swiss Canal in 1869 reduced the cost of transportation and made access to the Indian markets easier. Under foreign trade, we will be discussing about three main things, the composition of foreign trade, the direction of foreign trade of India and the generation of export surplus. Composition of foreign trade means what are the things that were being exported by India and what were the goods that were being imported into our country. Now with the adoption of the discriminatory policies by the British, India became an exporter of primary products such as raw silk, cotton, wool, sugar, indigo, jute etc and an importer of finished consumer goods like cotton and silk clothes, woolen clothes and capital goods like light machinery produced in Britain. I hope you remember that India was falling short of the capital goods industries and this was the reason why capital goods like light machinery that were being produced in Britain are, were now being imported into India. Let's talk about the direction of foreign trade. Direction of foreign trade means which are the countries with which India was trading at that point of time. Britain maintained monopoly control over India's export and import. As a result, more than half of India's foreign trade was restricted to Britain and the rest was allowed only with a few countries like Sri Lanka which was then called as Ceylon, China and Iran which was then called as Persia. Third, generation of export surplus. Now this is very important from exam point of view. Export surplus means the surplus that was generated out of the exports that India did towards Britain and other countries. Throughout the colonial period, India's foreign trade generated a large export surplus. But it was never used for the country's development. Rather, it adversely affected our country's economy because of two major facts. Firstly, because of more exports of several commodities, there was scarcity in the domestic market. And secondly, this export surplus was used to make payments for the expenses incurred by the British on import of invisible items like services, expenses on war, etc. Thus, in this way, this export surplus led to economic drain of Indian wealth. Now, economic drain of Indian wealth, drain of Indian wealth means that the Indian wealth was being drained out towards Britain and it was being used not for the development of Indian economy, rather it was being drained towards Britain, it was being used by Britain on its own imports and to meet its expenses on war, etc. Now, let's talk about the state of the development indicators like infrastructure, occupational structure and the demographic conditions. State of infrastructure. Infrastructural facilities were very poor in India during the British rule. However, some efforts had been made to develop the basic infrastructure to serve the colonial interests but it was not meant for the common man. Basic infrastructure was developed like roadways, railways, sea routes and most importantly the introduction of post and telegraph services. 
roadways. Now the condition of roads in India was unsatisfactory. But the Britishers tried to develop some roads. Of course, we know that the prime objective was the mobilization of army within the country and to transport raw material from countryside to the nearest railway station or port. Now we all know that this raw material was going to the British industries. Sea routes. The colonial government also took measures for developing inland trade and sea routes. However, inland waterways proved to be uneconomical in our country. Introduction of postal services. The introduction of expensive system of electric telegraph served the purpose of maintaining law and order. However, the postal services remained inadequate to serve the public purpose. Railways. The colonial government introduced railways in India which began their operation in the year 1850. The railways affected the structure of the Indian economy in various ways. Firstly, it provided cheap and rapid transportation, especially for distant travel. Also, it promoted national unity and understanding by breaking geographical and cultural barriers. This was beneficial for the Indians. Third, it encouraged commercialization of agriculture, which destroyed the self-sufficiency of the Indian village economies. Also, it promoted foreign trade, but its benefits actually accrued to the Indians. Occupational structure. Now, occupational structure means the distribution of working persons across different sectors. That is, the three sectors, primary, secondary and tertiary sectors. Now, this means the percentage of population engaged in each of these three sectors. That means how much of each sector is providing employment to the working population of the country. Now, we all know primary sector includes agriculture and allied activities. Secondary sector includes the industrial sector and the tertiary sector is the service sector. Now, during the colonial period, the agricultural sector accounted for the largest share of workforce, which remained at a high of 70 to 75 percent, while the manufacturing and services sectors accounted for only 10 percent and 15 to 20 percent, respectively. Another striking aspect was the growing regional variation. Parts of the then Madras Presidency, Bombay, and Bengal witnessed a decline in the dependence of workforce on the agricultural sector with a commensurate increase in the manufacturing and service sectors. Now, this means that in these presidencies, the contribution of the agricultural sector was on a decline, whereas the number of persons engaged in the secondary and tertiary sectors increased. However, there had been an increase in the share of the workforce in agriculture during the same time in states such as Odisha, Rajasthan and Punjab. Let's talk about the demographic condition of the Indian economy. Now, demographic condition means the quality of population. Quality of population can be seen with the help of various qualitative indicators like literacy rate, etc. Now, the first official census in India was conducted in the year 1881. Census figures collected since 1881 showed unevenness in India's population growth. India was in the first stage of demographic transition till 1921, which implies high birth rate and high death rate. Therefore, the rate of population growth remained very slow. After 1921, India entered the second stage of demographic transition. The year of 1921 is also thus known as the year of great divide in the history of Indian economy as after 1921, the growth rate of population started picking up. Now, let's talk about the various social development indicators of the Indian economy. The various social development indicators of the Indian economy were also not very encouraging. The average literacy rate was less than 16%. And among women, it was only 7%. Public healthcare facilities were highly inadequate 
to curb the communicable diseases which led to high mortality rate. Also, the infant mortality rate was quite alarming, estimated to be around 218 per thousand. Life expectancy was also very low, estimated to be around only 32 years. The country experienced mass poverty and per capita income was around Rs. 255 per annum in the year 1947. So till now we have discussed about the state of foreign trade. We have also talked about the state of other indicators like infrastructure, occupational structure and demographic condition of the Indian economy on the eve of independence. Let's have a quick recap of what we've done till now. We've talked about that there has been lack of adequate public health facilities and occurrence of frequent natural calamities and famines that resulted in high mortality rates. Also, some efforts were made by the colonial government to improve infrastructure facilities, but these efforts were spiced with selfish motives. However, independent Indian government had to build on this base through economic planning. I hope now you would be able to answer the following questions. Question 1. What do you understand by the drain of Indian wealth during the colonial period? Question 2. Indicate the volume and direction of trade at the time of independence. Question number 3. Give a quantitative appraisal of India's demographic profile during the colonial period. Now in this question, we expect you to give a quantitative appraisal, which means the data related to the demographics of the Indian economy or the demographic condition, the quality of population and the data related to that, right? Question 4. Underscore some of India's most crucial economic challenges at the time of independence. Now in this question, you can talk about all the problems that had been faced by the Indian economy on the eve of independence. You can discuss about the low level of economic development, the state of agricultural sector, how the agricultural sector faced problems. Thirdly, you can talk about the Indian industries, how they had been deindustrialized, what were the twofold motive of the British behind the deindustrialization of the Indian economy. Then you can talk about the inadequate infrastructure facilities and the problems faced by the Indian people during the colonial regime. Thank you.